Brian, thank you so much for joining us on the Sports Edits. It's really good to chat to you and I can't wait to hear about your career and what you've been up to and how you've been keeping busy in France. So thanks so much for your time. Okay, it's a pleasure. <laughs> but first, the first question is, how is life treating you in France? Oh, so far, so good. I've actually moved down. So I ended up my career in Paris in about 2011. And then I've uh, actually moved down to the south of France. So it's a little uh, fisherman's village, if I can put it like that, about 30 k's outside of Montpellier, where most people know because of you know, the South African players and a top 14 club called Montpellier. So we're just down the road from, from them. And uh, yeah, so living on the Mediterranean seaside and uh, enjoying, obviously, like I said, the French lifestyle. So no, it's, uh, it's, it's all good. <laughs> it's very, very good. <laughs> we're just going to talk about your career with Start Francais, if we can start off with that one as well. Um, how instrumental was Nick Mallet in, in terms of grooming, if I could just say grooming your rugby career? Yeah, I think, but obviously, you know, coming through, you know, my schoolboy rugby. So I think everybody also quite knows uh, Paul Anthony and Yanni Bidal for my schoolboy yeah. coaches. So, you know, maybe starting with them, that's where you start learning a lot about rugby and so on. And then by the time you get to start from, say, uh, Nick's there. So maybe at that level, we need less someone who's going to teach you things, but more someone that could manage or get the best out of you as a person and, a, and, a, and an individual. So I think Nick was always uh, good in that way, uh, in being able to, you know, get... When he came into the Stade Francais team, we actually arrived at the same time. Uh, so the same year that he got there, I also got to Stade Francais. And, uh, I mean, it was a team just full of stars. You know, there were the Dominicis, uh, David Dorado, Peter de Villiers, and was still there. So someone had to come in that had sort of a quite a strong character to be able to you know, get all those characters in the team together and mm. sort of in the same direction. So Nick was perfect for that. Uh, and yeah, so it was a good mix. So uh, obviously learned. I was still learning. Oh, that was my third year in, uh, in French rugby. So you're still learning as you go along because even though it's the same sport, you know, things are different here, whether it's culturally or how they prepare or how they train and things like that. Nick's advantage was that he, he, did, he did train and play in front. Um, yeah, coach and play in France before that. So, I mean, he could speak French and he could sort of, that's, sure. I think, one of the biggest things for, in, for overseas coaches coming into France is being able to adapt to the French culture and understand actually how it works. So, Nick was pretty good like that. Uh, we had a team full of sort of international players. So, we had Canadians, English players, Argentinians. So, yeah, that's also, you've got to throw that into the mix and take that into consideration when someone's coaching a team to sort of have all different nationalities, uh, and things like that. So, no, Nick was good like that. And then obviously, the, you could see in 2003, we won the championship and then we did it again in 2004. So, he had a two out of two record when he was at Stade Francais. So, it was perfect. Absolutely. Yeah, it's jolly good times for you. But I think what, what, what contributed to, to the success was those hard lines that you ran. My word, you were devastating. You broke through those defences a number of times. <laughs> yeah, that was sort of my role. Uh, you know, people still yeah. say to me today, oh, you're just a big, uh, you know, Bashing card that put it up in the center. So that was part of my, what my job was, but I never, and that's part of, I'll maybe get to it a bit later, what I've be, you know, been working on today is all about skill development. So not forgetting how to pass a rugby ball and not just bashing into people. So yeah, it was, uh, it was part of what I had to do, but uh, yeah, I did it to the best that I could, I suppose. Well, I think you definitely made an impact because I, I think a lot of the players would almost have been shocked because, you know, I'm sure the traditional ways, you know, pass the ball down the line, you just took that ball and you ran. And <laughs> you scored lots of tries and, but also, Alex, that you were a jolly, jolly good kicker. Um, you just dropped kicked a few goals out of the blue from the 10 meter line. <laughs> just awesome. To yeah, see. that's. Uh, <laughs> no, but that's also, like I say, coming back to the skills, you know, always, you know, concentrating on my passing, on my kicking and stuff. I maybe wasn't as. I could kick the long kicks, but I wasn't probably as accurate as a Diego Dominguez or Juan Martin Hernandez that I, you know, I was lucky enough to play, play with. But uh, every now and then when they, they did call upon me to, to have a go at goal, I, I, I normally would get it in between the posts. So that was, that was good. <laughs> <laughs> that was very, very good. But, you know, personally, playing rugby, like you said for you, playing rugby in France was obviously the right move for you. It was something that um, paid dividends, if I can say it, for you. But it was also... You know, did you also enjoy the, the culture there of how they play the game and there was almost like a driving force for you to get the most out of your game? Yeah, well, like I said, it's different. So probably good for me that I came when I was still quite young. I started off in Italy when I was just, yeah, I just turned 19. So I got to Italy pretty young. So that was already my first uh, experience in a Latin sort of based country, you know, the Europeans as such. And then moving over to France was maybe just a language 
barrier that was in the beginning. But yeah, just adapting to, you know, when you're young, I think it's different to when you sort of come over at the end of your career, when you sort of set in your ways and used to a lot of things. I came over when I was still pretty young. So, you know, easy for me to sort of adapt and learn as I went along. So, yeah, in some ways I often say I'm still, I'm always, I'll always be South African, but from a rugby point of view, I think I was more sort of French formed, if I could put it like that, you know, just the, the way they do things over here in France. And so I, I never really had much to compare with other than my sort of short schoolboy uh, rugby career. So, yeah, I was pr pretty much learned as I went along and that was how, so yeah, like I say, I never really played in super rugby or in South Africa, any franchises and stuff like that. So, uh French rugby is just about all I know, I suppose, when it comes from a professional career point of view. But I mean, it, it is a great league to play in because, I mean, there's so much passion there and there's so much diverse rugby, I would say. Um, is that also a thing that sort of makes it what it is, how diverse it is in terms of the different players that come in from other countries? Yeah, no, that was definitely. I mean, obviously, you know, having players that come in from all over the, all over the world, they've got a... A champion, you know, it probably is the only championship in the world where you have so many different nationalities. So that also, you know, even just learning things, sharing things, players, coaches, it's really a, a great melting pot for world rugby, I think. So, yeah, it's, uh, and it's still going on like that. They have brought in sort of systems where they're looking to develop uh, more of the young French players coming through. But, uh, yeah, it's, they're struggling to get that right because they, you know, obviously trying to get the French team as uh, competitive as what they can. But that still doesn't, you know, they, you know, they still struggle to find good props, lots, you know, certain position specific uh, players that they, that they need, uh, at least at a club level. So, uh, yeah, yeah, I think they'll always have that international flavor to the top 14 or the Pro D2 championships that they have in France. So it's, it's good. It's very, very, very good indeed. But talking about it, obviously, you know, you, you, your attacking game was excellent. Um, your defensive game was also proper, though, often on a number of occasions. You were seen making two tackles in a row. I don't know how you managed to do that on a number of occasions. You must have been one fit rugby player. <laughs> yes. Oh, no, I don't know. I think it's just uh, you just competitive. So you don't <laughs> want the other guys to get past you, so you do your best to, yeah. to keep them out. But it must have been that your work rate was just high. Is that something that you focus on as well, just to have a high work rate game in, game out? Yeah, it's just uh, like I think just competing at the best you can be, you know, just trying every everything that you could do, do it to your the best of your ability, and uh, yeah, whether it's wherever you are, just trying to improve all the time. So, mate, like I said, just being a competitor and wanting to win all the time, I think that's what a bit of the, one of the sort of aspects of the culture at the Stade Francais was uh, was being competitive, being competitive mm -hmm. all the time, game in and game out. So yeah, that's a, was important to us. Very very important. Because just going on and talking about the national side now, and there's the competition that's going to kick on again soon, the, the Six Nations. Um, and France and England are, are neck and neck. They are actually on the same points tally. Do you think France are going to have the, the drive to actually go all the way and actually win this year's championship? I, th I think uh, Fabian Galtier came in and, you know, whenever you get a new coach, you know, a new staff, and everything's a little bit different. You know, everybody's back on their tippy toes and, and ready to perform. So I think they had a good win over the English. I think the English were a bit still, uh, how do you say, shell-shocked after the World Cup final. Uh, so the French managed to get past them. But yeah, it's going to be a tough one. French rugby is always like that. You know, you never know how consistent they're going to be. So it's always that sort of up and down. I think Fabian Galtier is bringing in another approach to the way they train and the way they prepare. So we'll just have to see. And if they can do that now, then hopefully they'll be competitive in the 2023 uh, World Cup campaign. But they can have to start with something. And I think they've really brought a lot of training methods or, you know, just the way they prepare and the way they look at the, the way the, the French are playing compared to how it has been historically. Uh, I think, yeah, that will definitely be something positive. So you never know. I think we've all gone through a bit of a tough period now with the virus, the COVID. Uh, so it's, I think it's just up there. I don't, I, don't, I don't know how. It just depends. I think how everybody's adapted to the situation concerning the virus. And then just see, you know... <laughs> It's, it's tough. You've got, all the, you've got all the French players that are in the club. So there's a big argument going on now because they want to take away the French players for about seven weeks from the club. So the clubs aren't very happy about that and so on. So uh, whether the preparation has gotten them back to an international level, whether the Irish have also, you know, it just depends on a lot, a lot of things. So I think for now it's a little bit unknown, which is also quite nice. Uh, and then see what happens when the guys get onto the field. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. So just touching on the 2023 World Cup and expecting France to hopefully make it to the semi-finals. 
is the squad that they currently have something that they're building on so they're going to try and do well at Six Nations and every year just keep building on, building on so they're really prepared for that World Cup? What do you think? Is it the objective? No, for sure. But I think the objective would be to win the World Cup. That's what they're actually looking at, and which is normal, I suppose. I mean, the French have always had a good record when it comes to World Cup uh, results and, and, you know, how, you know, ending up either semi-finals or finals and then missing out maybe on, on, a, on a close victory that they could have had to New Zealand in 2011. So I think, uh, no, definitely. I think that that's, that's already in the back of their minds now. Uh, obviously, when they won the campaign to have the World Cup in France, uh, straight away, they started thinking of how we're going to get it. You know, so I think they've got a bit of confidence saying that the under twenties won the World Cup, I think twice in a row, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, yeah. something. Yeah, some good talent coming through. So in the next couple of years, most of those players you've got Antoine Dupont at number nine, uh, Intermac at ten. So that's already uh, probably looking like that they'll be in place for the 2023 World Cup. So I think also what they've done in the past is a lot of times they they how can I put it. They select players, but there's no consistency or let, letting players have enough time to sort of grow into a position and, and actually get comfortable and be performant in any other position. So I think now they've actually got some really good talent that they can actually do that with. So, uh, yeah, hopefully they, could, hopefully they can do that. You know what it's like when uh, the, the host country wins the World Cup, what it can do for the country and the sports. So, yeah, let, let's see what they can do. But once again, if I was a betting man, I wouldn't put my money on France because you just, they, they, you know, one day they'll wake up and they could beat anybody in the world and the next day they could lose to the worst in the world. So it's, uh, I think yeah. the home ground advantage is definitely going to play a role. Uh, but then again, that's not everything. So I think you know, the consistency or just picking up their, their level to be able to beat the likes of England, New Zealand, South Africa, sort of, you know, and we all know in a World Cup, you have to go sort of seven weeks non-stop which is a tough one. We saw with England where they might have played their final in the semi-final against New Zealand uh, to pull it out the bag every single week before you can lift that trophy. It's really, really tough. So it's yeah. definitely one of the objectives, I'm sure, but we'll, we'll see how they go. It's true because, Brian, you know, I've chatted to a lot of people who've, who've either played rugby in France and spent some time there, maybe as a coach, but I mean, you've played for France. So what is it where they sort of, like you said, they wake up one day and say, right, all guns blazing, we're going to do this. And then the next game, they sort of feel, well, maybe not today's our day. <laughs> what? <laughs> what is the sort of, why do you think that happens? What leads to that? It's, it's the Latin temperament. I think it's just the, the Latin way of, it's their okay. culture. You know, okay. they could get very angry or very sad or very happy. And it just goes from one to the next. And I think that's also just the way it goes. You know, you see the passion in the stands, the crowds, you know, very happy. Well, yeah, just, I think the, the, the more emotional culture that they have brings the fact that yeah, one day it's good, the next day it's bad. But that's just <laughs> the, the, the <laughs> I just I find it fascinating. I really, really do. But it, it, that's what makes it unique, I guess. So it's it's all good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well you look at the like the English will be more consistent, more yeah. sort of preparing, you know, just regulating what they do. And then the French are just like you say, once again up and down. But once again it's just cultural and that makes it all so much more interesting. Absolutely, absolutely. We're going we're gonna to come back to a bit of the rugby and things like that, but I just want to touch a bit more on, on what you're currently doing, Brian. Um, am I right in saying you're involved in a thing called Catch and Think, uh, play ball as well? Yeah, that's it. So just a bit of history is when I stopped my playing career, then obviously I needed to do something else because, uh, you know, it didn't, and part of the guys had never or studied or had anything else on the side. So once I stopped on my injury in 2011, and then I had this idea that, uh, like I said, soccer is a popular game and you can play it all over the world. And I said, geez, if I, I've got to find something on a rugby ball that can have the same impact, you know, uh, mm -hmm. sort of promoting and developing the game of rugby. And I had this idea in my head where uh, basically what I did is I put pictures and different colors on the ball. So each picture has a different color on the ball. And when you catch the ball, so just playing on the words rule of thumb, when you catch the ball, your thumb touches one of the zones on the ball. And that would be your indication of what technique or skill to use to pass the ball back to another player. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, that's working on your basic rugby skills, catching the ball with two hands, keeping your eyes on the ball. And then there's one rule as well, what I brought in for a little bit of communication. So those are your basic rugby skills while you're playing a game. And then we met in 2017. I met some researchers. I'm always looking, you know, what's new in rugby, the skills, what, what coaches are doing. And got in touch with some researchers who work for a company called Neurovision in Switzerland. And they said, geez, there's a lot more going on with your ball than what you think. So they started, they actually said the, the, the catchphrase was, if kids play with this ball 20 minutes a week, they'll have better results in school. So 
Wow. I said, well, I can tell that to parents. Wow. That, that was awesome. So we, we got onto the whole uh, sort of research and development about the cognitive development that the bull brings. So associating a color to a skill but means your brain has to work a little bit more than just reacting to a color. Uh, and we just got onto that. So for the last few years, been working with neurosurgeons, uh, professors at the university in Lyon that uh, work on attention, uh, um, was it Dr. Leonard Zaykovsky, who I've read, just you know, read his book and, and inspired a lot of what he's studied since the 1980s as a sports scientist to what they're doing today, all just fits into what we're now you know, offering to coaches to be able to bring into their rugby training. So when you've gone from, first of all, you know, most, when we're talking just rugby, because there's two sort of aspects, there's a the rugby side and there's the educational side. So we're actually writing programs now for the USA and Australia wow. where it's basically just for PE teachers and students at schools where they can then work or develop their cognitive abilities, giving them better attention spans, which means that they can have uh, more chance of learning what they are actually learning in class. Our brains are like muscles. So training your brain will give you a better chance of success in life. So that's basically what we're putting in place now. We'll have a digital app uh, coming out to an online course where, wow. like I said, we great is for the promotion of rugby is any teacher or parent can actually do the course and then be able to administer it. It's a very, very simple concept, but the impact that it has on kids, on their vision, on their brains, on their attention spans uh, is just unbelievable. And this game then gets them playing with a rugby ball and they can play it anywhere. You can have boys and girls, there's no contact, you know, so it's, it's from a promotional and development side, it's, uh, it's really something I think innovative and new and it's a never been seen concept before and you think it's so simple just uh, linking a color to a skill but that's actually where your cognitive development begins so the last two years have been passionate and um, yeah so we, we're getting that all, all, all in line now uh, I've been doing it so we've actually been doing it ourselves the whole COVID situation has actually forced us to go to the sort of you know uh, coaching coaches online or teachers online mm -hmm. Uh, because you can't always be in bigger groups now. You've got to keep your social distancing and things like that. And uh, so, yeah, that's uh, we've done about 25,000 kids so far uh, coaching with this, with this, uh, with the ball and coaches that we do in rugby clubs. We do go to schools. It was amazing in America. In one morning, we saw 680 kids coming through. It's just the numbers are unbelievable in America. In the USA, it's just unbelievable. But uh, yeah. Just once again, coming back to that fact of being, you know, training the brain, giving a physical activity that not only does the body, but we actually training the brain as well. Um, so yeah, that's that's what's been keeping me busy for the last couple of years, uh, doing training games and uh, Toulouse. So the, the professional team Toulouse, I've got like a rugby net with the different targets and the colours and the numbers, and so a couple of drills that we use for that. Toulouse have actually taken it on, so we're very happy that a professional team has actually also seen the benefits that they can get from. Uh, from using this this concept because like i said so first of all it was all physical players had to get bigger and stronger to dominate and and perform and then it went on to nutrition so whatever you're eating that will sort of directly impact your performance and now we've gone on to the mental side so the mental preparation that players need but yes. um there's, there's no real tools out there with it unless it be i know some teams use the neuro tracker there's a couple of online uh, you know on screens but what i've done is i've used those principles and we just put the players back into their natural environment where they've got a rugby ball, they've got players, or they've got targets around them. So it's not just on a screen where you're pushing buttons or following balls. We're using those principles, which are really good, but we just put those into rugby drills with the rugby ball. So it can be, like I said, it goes from young girls in a, in a, in a, in a junior school that have never touched a rugby ball before, all the way up to Antoine Dupont. There's actually been on Canal Plus, uh, there was a um, documentary on him, and he's using the ball and the net. Uh, so we used that. That's what's so nice about the ball. We've had some great uh, results with the Down syndrome kid that we've been working with as wow. well. So it goes everything that's got to do with the brain. So anybody that's got a brain can be impacted by Amazing, the brain. So we're doing it with a rugby ball, and uh, we're soon going to have basketball, handball, and netball as well because it's the same principles: catching yeah. with two hands, keeping your eyes on the ball, and then just linking a skill to it or a technique to a color. And and uh, so yeah, hopefully. Not just impacting rugby players or sports players when we go back to the basketball, handball or netball. Uh, it's also then impacting kids and their lives at school academically to be able to, you know, maybe succeed in life because we just uh, sort of combating the, the, the impact that we have in the digital world that we live in today. So that's the attention spans are getting smaller and smaller. Yeah. Uh, there's there's, there's uh, uh, 
recent uh, results come out with the, the frontal cortex that is getting smaller and smaller. It's just because your brain's passive when you've got a cell phone or a screen and social media and things. Your brain's not functioning how it naturally should. So we just combat that a little bit by giving an activity, a Excellent. sporting activity. And if you can do it with a rugby ball, it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's nice. Especially, like I said, when we saw Matteo, uh, uh, a guy with his, um, a friend of ours, his son's got Down syndrome, so he does it on a regular basis. And when you can see that wow. he can play already with kids that are, I say, normal, normal kids, he's, 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 he plays with them normally. And it also has helped him in his everyday life because he can now take in information and react quicker than what he was before. So that's, that's really nice. We've got a 25-episode uh, TV program for kids coming out 9 September. We, we filmed 25 episodes, so that's also the next step. So everything's slowly coming together now. Where we've got a, a nice finished product where we can actually, you know, once again, like I said, coaches can learn it. It's pretty easy to implement. There's no extra time on the training or, you know, PE teachers that haven't been rugby players can also do it without having any sort of rugby knowledge. And so on and so on. So, yeah, there's a lot of benefits to it. And uh, we're excited to sort of get it out to as many people. When, when, when technology and rugby meet, it's a great thing. Eh? Sure. That is. That's the thing. So, what's nice is that obviously you've got the technology uh, that you've got the screens or the, you know, and, uh, but this is just a ball. Uh, a guy, uh, uh, Roman, who works at uh, Clamour Front, who does all the eye testing for all the pro players. So, they do a lot of what's got to do with the vision. Uh, and they, they were investing, I think they paid 20,000 euros for a screen that does cognitive development. And he said, you guys are crazy. He said, just buy a ball. Brian leverberg has got a ball. It's, uh, it's going to cost you nothing. And uh, you're going to wow, get better wow. results using the ball. So that's, that's the interesting sign. So at least we can, this sort of, so it's the technology, but the, 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 the concept or the method, we can get this down to all coaches, uh, teachers, uh, where, wherever they are, like I said, and that's you know, hopefully have an impact on rugby. Like we go back to me just bashing people think that was it, but uh, <laughs> upscale, upscale players for rugby, but not only get them also, you know, uh, like I said, developing that cognitive side that, that today is sort of really becoming a problem in society. So yeah. it's, uh, yeah, it's been passionate and interesting. So like I'm still in rugby because I needed to find something to do, but this has taken me on a journey that's, uh, yeah, I've been very interesting and passionate learning about uh, how the brain works. Well, Brian, I can see you're passionate, and that's excellent. It's so good to hear how rugby is actually helping people. You know, often we get this yes. concept where you must, you know, make it professional as a career. Now it's actually helping people become better, which is, that is so good to hear. That's probably the best yeah. thing I've heard in a long time, how you're actually helping people get better mentally. That's fantastic. That's yeah, fantastic. no, it's uh, really yeah, for kids, like I said, and, uh, well, in, in America at least, because they don't have any rugby knowledge. There's no coaches. So the, the way we've written the program is that you can go from zero rugby knowledge. So you can do the, the, the cycles from on the first levels. And probably after three or the, in the fourth cycle, we get in them to then be able to coach seven aside rugby teams. Excellent. So, so mm. that from a rugby development or promotion side of view is, is, is brilliant from, from all sides because you can't just make a rugby coach if he's never played rugby or, 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 or you know watch the game of rugby especially in countries like the like america um it's it's, it's tough to sort of just input, input that knowledge into them but we sort of take them through just work, working on the skills first so skills and then sort of smaller game uh situations if i can put it like that and then just yeah taking them up but like, like i said today our main focus is actually on that cognitive development which is uh and once again uh, valid for anybody that's got a brain, even elderly folk that we actually will be just, we're starting an activity in, in, in set just to keep those, you know, info, act, uh, decision, analyze, action, you know, that sort of natural brain process that you're doing that elderly people also sort of slowly tapers off at the end of their lives, to, you know, get them going again. And uh, yeah, so it's, and, and doing that with a rugby ball, obviously being a rugby player that we can still be using a rugby ball is great. But like I said, we'll, uh, we'll be moving on to basketball, handball and netball uh, very soon. Hey, Brian, you've touched on something that I think is going to revolutionize sport as a whole. Our well, radio, yeah. just what, hearing what you're saying, I think it's something that people have been searching for all this time. And, you know, we always say play sport, get involved, get involved. Now, here's a perfect reason for coaches to be coached and to coach students. It, this, is, this is fantastic. So as soon as yeah. I think, you know, because I want to, I no. want to 
Yeah, this is fantastic. The Dr. Zykowski in his book said, but we don't, people know that they might have to go into this and, you know, coach sort of cognitive development and things, but they don't know how to. Yeah. And total by chance, I probably, you know, this, this ball that I did, the game that I had on the ball has taken us down that path. And we realize that that's actually what we're doing. So now we can offer that as a tool for coaches to, to use. And uh, what else is I going to say now about the coaches? I'm sorry. I've, you know. sorry just, so for coaches as well, what we've done is we've learned how the brain actually learns. And we can share that with coaches as well, because the traditional way that coaches teach players is not how uh, the brain actually learns the best. So what we've done is we've just given a couple of, you know, uh, it might be active, impl uh, how do you say, act um, my French mixes up my English now, active implications, so getting players involved, uh, saying that forgetting is normal. So we'll do like a training session today and then we'll come back to it maybe end of the week or two weeks down the line. So the brain actually then has to go back and remember. So all little points is like that. using the neuroscience of how the brain learns the best and bringing that in very simply for coaches just to follow uh, uh, coaching cycles, working on essentials. You know, you, you'll get a coach saying, uh, hold the ball like this, follow through, run straight, turn your shoulders, head up, head down, you know, and then a kid or, or a player. You know, so once again, go back to neuroscience, your brain can only take in so many information. So, you, you can't give all that information. He's not going to get any of it. So rather just work on essentials, maybe hand position or target, and that's all you're worried about. You know? So little tips like that that we can get for coaches will actually help them get their message across to the kids, help them learn quicker, and then obviously develop more as, as players. But that's all just going back to the neuroscience of how a brain naturally learns and it's, you know, all those sort of things are, which is also good, and the timing has been good. There's, these are all uh, professors and researchers and doctors. All of this is now, they can prove it now, you know, with the IRM machine, MRI machines, uh, the tests that have been going on for the last 15, 20 years. All those results are coming out now and being confirmed. So that's why we can sort of base our project or method on that and then say, guys, this is, this is how we should maybe have a look at doing things. But once again, you say neuroscience and it sounds complicated, but it's actually, uh, it's actually so simple, you know, it's so simple. So, yeah, well, like I said, now we, we're full on now. We actually, it's for, it's for the Australian market to start off with. Uh, but then very, very quickly, I was in South Africa a while back and almost, yeah, just about all the schools that we went to go and see were, were, were keen on, on using the ball. There we go. Uh, there we go. With yeah. the Stormers, the, the Kings, uh, the Lions, we went and saw them as well. So... Once we get everything online, I think that, yeah, we'll get it out. Like I said, the most important for us would be teachers and schools, like an activity, a physical activity that not only does the body, but the brain as well. So, yeah, that's what's been keeping me busy since I stopped playing, but it's, uh, it's exciting. <laughs> and, uh, Brian, that's, that's brilliant. It is so good to hear that yeah. we're finally getting, I'd say, to use the mind properly. Um, you know, because oh. obviously learners have natural talent. They can do anything, but just help the mind, like you said, understanding how the mind learns, that is, that is fantastic to hear. From a, that's from a learning point of view. And then you get the coaches where you say, run around the field twice, and then they start doing passing drills, and the balls are getting dropped, the players aren't concentrated, and then they say, but concentrate, guys, you know, you, you know focus. And then, but that's not going to help them either. So what we've actually worked on with a neurosurgeon, he says the most important thing in a training session is to activate the hands, the eyes, and the brain. So we don't even, before we even start moving, those are the first things that we activate. That's where we get the focus and the attention and the guys sort of, you know, ready for training. And then you can start getting them to run. You know, so it's, all, it's going a little bit against what people would do. You say, first warm up, run around the field. But you, you're warming up your legs, but your brain's still going, oh, I forgot to hand in that assignment. What about next week? Uh, what am I doing? And then you're dropping balls. And, and then the coach yeah. is like, why can't I get these guys focused? So that's part of it as well. And we've got a mental activation routine. So uh, also pre-activating your brain will also just uplift your performance. Whether you're an amateur player, whether you're a schoolboy player, whether you're a professional player, uh, whether you're a referee, that's even for referees, you know, they've also got to make decisions on, they see something, they get options, they need to decide. And all this has to be done in a split second. But mm. uh, if you're interested, I'll send you, we'll, we'll have a couple of videos that I've yeah. from this episode. I'll be cutting it out. And you'll see how quickly kids can learn it. So, I mean, in America, they didn't have any rugby knowledge. Uh, within 10 minutes, the kids have got the skills, they've got the, they've got the colors, and, wow. and there you go, and then you can play the game. And in a split second, these kids have to catch the ball, associate the color with the skill, look for space, because we put a defender like a pig in the middle, you know, who has to touch or intercept the ball, look for space, and then do the correct skill or passing technique to get it to another player in the circle. 
Sure. And it's amazing how quick, how quick the players can actually pick that up and then you go, but yeah, so it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's great. So I'll be very happy the way it's been progressing. And like I said, yeah. now we want as many kids to be able to, to get their hands on, on, on the ball. So it's, uh, it's, mm, it's good. Mm, mm. No, Brian, that, that, that's, that's something amazing to see. Talk yeah. about you know, player development. This is going to be it. So you're developing the mental aspect, you're developing the skills. They're going to be fit and they're going to be enjoying their rugby. You can't ask for much more. It's a, it's a complete package. Yeah, it's a complete package. Like I said, we actually, with the American market, that we, it's for all the public schools. So, the, the, you know, the attention, attentional capabilities is a real problem that they've seen in America. So they want to combat that in a certain way. Uh, and so what I, I know it for sure, because I've seen, we've done about 160 different clubs in France that we've gone to all over in the past six years or so. And uh, you get kids that have been playing rugby for four, four or five years. And I'm, I'm not lying to you, not 5% of the kids. So we've got, like I say, about 20,000 kids in France that we've seen. Not 5% of them can do at least two rugby techniques correctly. It's wow. unbelievable. And what I've said is now, I said, we'll go to America, non-rugby playing kids that will do this cycle for at least one year or two years. Not even, like I said, in 10 minutes, we've got the kids doing at least 500 passes. In, in a 10 minute uh, you know, warm up where I said activating hands, eyes and brain between 350 and 500 passes and those kids will have better rugby skill after one year than other kids that have been doing rugby for five years it's, it's, uh, so that's also what we're trying to at least in France sort of bring their attention to the fact that you've got one or two balls at a training session for 30 kids you've got one kid that spends two hours at your training session he touches the ball maybe five times he drops it once and you shout at him yeah. Uh, so that's not really fun, you know, when you, and then you say, well, how do you want them to improve if they haven't got a ball in their hands and they can't actually, uh, you know, develop that skill. And then the only time they do touch it, they drop it and they get shouted at. So it's all those sort of things that we're trying to bring their attention to. Yeah, yeah this is going to change rugby coaching. I think coaching overall, this is going to change things and make things that much more better. Wow. Can't yeah. wait to see when it's out there. That's exciting. That's. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll send you a bit of info and stuff. Like I said, we just uh, the, the, our old uh, the original website that we've got now is a little bit more based on the rugby side, but uh, we'll be we'll be redoing a like I said now with the, we're getting onto the online course that we're putting in place, all the different courses that we got. But as soon as we've got the new website, which we'll be doing, that will be a, you know give you a lot more information on the brain and the cognitive development. I'll I'll send it through to you if you if you are interested and want to check it out with Absolutely. the, the yeah. few videos and. Yeah, so it's good. Did you play rugby as well? Did a lot of coaching. Played a little bit, coaching. but a lot of coaching, yeah. yeah. You know, okay, so this, was, this, this would make sense to you then? We, 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 a lot of sense. Yeah. yeah, okay. No, that's great. Well, I hope uh, all the other coaches... We've kept going because we've only had positive feedback from the coaches and the players that, that, uh, that, have, that have seen it and understood it and that, like I say, that, yeah, that, have, that have tried it out. So it's, uh, it's, that's definitely kept us on the right way. And then obviously all the confirmation that we have from the, from the scientists and researchers that what we're doing is actually confirmed and that we're going the right way. So that's, uh, yeah, that's good. Wow, Brian, that's great. Because, you know, like, like you mentioned, you know, times have changed and it's great to see that you found something that's actually almost, I would say, going to move the game of rugby even that much more forward. So it's, it's really, really good. So what, I was, what we say as well is if you can, from a younger age, get kids already just having fun. So while they're having fun, they're working on their rugby skills. So that means they might play rugby for a little bit longer. You might get kids involved in rugby that were never going to play rugby through an activity in their school because it's a cognitive development uh, you know, activity. And then also, I strongly believe that if, if we, you know, now, obviously in France, there's been a couple of rugby players that have died due to contacts and, you know, in tackles, double tackles and things like that. So people are getting more and more scared of getting their kids yeah. involved in rugby. But I think what I've seen here, at least in France, is a lot of the kids, like I said, don't have the technical skills to be able to actually make passes. They might be able to pass one way, give a spin pass, and that's it. So what I've seen is they can't pass, so what they do is they go into contact. That's just the easy way out, you know, and that's also what they see every week, week in and week out on TV is the, the professionals just smashing into each other, you know, one pass contact, one pass contact. So what I'm thinking is if we can upscale players, we'll go back to a game where we go back to sort of more running into space, passing into space, mm -hmm. uh, out of that sort of contact idea where you've got to dominate physically your, your, your opponent, maybe now moving the ball around or being able to throw a 15, 20 meter skip pass to get the ball in to space quicker will be a more spectacular and safer game of rugby so we, we're promoting all of that as well because that's what I was, the next thing I was going to say is that I know I've heard a lot of people 
you know, you see a, a good youngster and say, hey man, you know, what's your thoughts on rugby? No, I'm going to get hurt. So straight away, they've made up their mind, I'm going to get hurt because of what they've been taught, just go into contact, you know? So I'm so glad yes. because I believe if you've got the skill, you're going to manage it, you're going to be fine. You'll be able to manipulate the situation and get out of it. And it also makes me think of a school, um, you know, Bishops in, in Cape Town is known for running rugby. They're going to love your program. <laughs> it's because it's... Yeah, well, I hope so. I hope so. They don't just enhance their rugby even more because I believe yes. in that. But that I'm talking about my opinion. I believe in that running rugby. I think it's, it's what it should be. It's, it's great to watch. But yeah, Brian, good stuff. Really, really good stuff. Yeah. No, thank you. Uh, and um, one of the things is, I know you're not directly involved because obviously you've been in France, but uh, there's talk of the rugby championships of South Africa, Australia, New Zealand, Argentina <laughs> taking place possibly in Australia. And there's been some feedback saying South Africa's not ready, South Africa's not ready to do that. You know, New Zealand have had their super rugby things. Australia's been playing rugby. Should South Africa take part in it? It'll be good for the country, won't it? To, to be part of the championship? Yeah. I think so. I think it's, yeah, it's always good to have international games. I mean, especially once again, after what we've been through now, this whole COVID uh, and the adapting that everybody needs to go through. So I think we actually realized how much we missed the live sports. So that might get people yeah. sort of back. You know, you sort of got used to it. There's a game on just about every weekend and you got used to it. And I think the time off has actually said it's actually quite good to have some live sport on and see the best playing oh. against each other. So, uh, yeah, I, I, Obviously, you know, always like just coming back to that, saying, that, you know, uh, having the best play against each other, that's, that's, that's what's interesting. And mm. I think that's from the sporting side. And I think you just must not forget the financial side. I think quite a lot of the unions now are actually also running after anywhere where they can get revenue to keep the sport alive. Mm. So that's also maybe something else that needs to just be brought into the picture and find a good balance between obviously having good games and then sort of bringing in a bit of revenue to keep the sport alive and, and, and well. So I think, it's, I think it's important. I think if any teams can participate, no matter where it is or how it will work out, I think it's important to, to remember all the aspects that go into what will keep the sport, you know, in a healthy shape or in a good place for, for the future. For sure. Absolutely. That's good, bro. That's really good to see. <laughs> But then I want to talk about one or two moments where you've had your moments of brilliance. And I saw a clip of you where you, you did a drop goal from a 10 meter and you were under quite a bit of pressure. I can't remember who passed the ball to you, but I remember you slotting that drop goal from the 10 meter line. And it was quite an important game. I'm trying to remember this off, but... It would have been the final, I think, and that was Augustine Pichot, the ex, obviously the Argentinian uh, scrum off and or the ex vice exactly. president. Yeah. Rugby. So, uh, Gus, he passed me the ball. It was in the semi final in 2005 against Biarritz sure. uh, at the France. I can remember that, that one. That, that's one of the ones that just comes to my mind. Yeah. So, it's, uh, well, he it was a 22 dropout. He caught it, passed it to me, and I was on the 10 minute line and then just took you a just shot at goal. And, so, it was, it, was, yeah, it was good. So, yeah, no, it was definitely Gus Pichot that passed me the ball. <laughs> <laughs> so, you, you just you know, handled those, those hard pressure moments very, very well, you know, just in the heat of the moment. I'm feeling good about it and go for it. It's excellent. That's, that's it. Yeah. That's the, it's coming back to a little bit. What we're working on now today is to the be bets. able to get place to bet only on what yeah. essential information they need to and live in the moment, not worry about anything else. So that's exactly, it's a sort of that, what they talk about is the flow state where everything seems to be in slow motion. You, you seem to be as perform, you know, your, your performance is way up there. Uh, so I definitely felt like that a couple of times in my career. Uh, that might have been one of the moments. There was, a, you know, maybe you know, getting into the finals. It was good as the stuff from say team that we had. Always when we got into the competitive final stages, we always just seemed to have this confidence that we were going to win and that we were going to make it. So, yeah, you know, we weren't worried about losing. We weren't worried about what anyone was going to say. And I think that sort of was a part of also being able to perform as an individual in the team environment where you just knew it was going to go well. It was, it was quite mm. amazing. So, but I say that at the same time we lost that game. But uh, yeah, small moments like that definitely were part of uh, yeah, just concentrating what you have to do, not worrying about missing it. I and mean, if I, for one second, thought, what if I miss this, it probably wouldn't have gone through. So that's also what we're trying to share with players now and, and, and train them for top level rugby. And I can see your program definitely helping players with that, the way you guys are going to do that. The yeah. mental activation routine, uh, the routines that you can bring in regular, and, and that's also some of the stuff that's come out now, is we can actually train our brains to get into that flow state of mind more regularly. So that's what we're trying to get into play, is saying you can actually get into that, you can actually train your mind to be able to get into that flow state. So uh, 
uh, that's, yeah. And, and when you can start just to conceive the limitless uh, boundaries or, or, or power that your mind can have and the impact that it can have on your performance and your, and your playing ability, it's just it's unbelievable. So, mm. yeah, that all comes back to, I, I mean, I didn't, I just did that sort of naturally and I was lucky maybe to have it at the right time during, the, during those matches. But now we've actually got the, 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 the science to say you, you can train yourself to get into that state of mind more often than not. So sure. yeah, for any coach or, or, or top player, that's, that's what you're looking for. That's brilliant. Again, so it's going to make rugby even that much more exciting than what it really is. So, good I stuff. Hope so. Really good stuff. <laughs> yeah. Well, Brian, I've really enjoyed chatting to you. I really enjoy what you're doing. It's so good to hear what you're aiming for there in terms of your program. It's exciting times for you, man. I really trust it's going to go well. And the yeah, no, thanks. Nicely. And that's, it was nice chatting to you too. Uh, yeah, well, like I said, I'll... Uh, as soon as I've got a couple of nice videos, we've got that from the TV episode that comes out. So I should be getting that this weekend. And once it's all on the website and ready, I'll definitely send you the link and you can tell me what you think about it. Yeah. And look, I mean, I'm happy to share it on my, my Facebook page and my website and things like that as well. I'm, I'm happy to. Okay. That'd be great. Yeah, the more people yeah. we can get sort of aware about this, uh, like it, 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 it'll be great. So where are you based? In Cape Town. In Cape Town. Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, like I said. I'll, uh, I've actually got a couple of balls. Like I said, I was out in South Africa. And we just did a, you know, sort of testing the, test the market, seeing what the coaches in South Africa would think about it and stuff. So I was uh, you know, down in Stellenbosch. What's his name? Uh, is it Reinhardt? Down at uh, Paul Ruiz. Oh, Reinhardt Kornbrink, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I saw, yeah, I saw him and a couple of other coaches up and, you know, but um, most of the people, so yeah, they were definitely sweet. I liked what I was talking about and what no, I was doing. I think so. So, yeah, uh, I'll, I'll bring you a ball next time I'm down in Cape Town and we can try it out. And I'll invite you for a bra. No problem. <laughs> That's good. Thanks very bra? much. And, uh, Go well, man. Well. Cheers, boys. Okay.